kid. Seriously. <laughs> Welcome to the comeback version of the Star Wars In Review podcast. We're the only podcast in your life that's continually shrouded in mystery and intrigue. At the table today, we have Luke Neitzel and Maya Madrid, who once shared a honeymoon together on an island of flowers. Every so often we get together, discuss news in the realm of Star Wars. We're going to answer a few of your kids' seriously serious questions and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Luke Neitzel, how are you? I am fabulous. And I think that's great, because we had very contrasting weeks, We did, if possible. My week was filled with 90 degree weather and pools and no work, and yours was filled with passing stones through your dick, hopefully, what? but not successfully. You, why, why would you reveal my medical history? A, a you brought it why up on you? a previous episode, I, I did. and B, I did. you're trying to pass a stone through your dick, and that's funny. Yeah, uh, why don't you talk about your vacation, Dick? Thank you for putting my medical history out on the entire internet. I, I covered it. It was warm and sunny and I wasn't at work and that's that's all you really need in life and not passing things through my dick. Well, the, didn't the, want uh, to go through. So. <laughs> yeah, the truth everybody is, yeah, I do. I you know a couple of weeks back I had, had talked about how I feared that I had a kidney stone. I do, in fact, have a kidney stone. Worse, as I was set to have surgery, I had the influenza and was unable to go through the operation. I actually got stopped by the anesthesiologist right before going in. So I still have that kidney stone. Uh, thanks to Luke. Basically, when I was gone, he had to carry uh, the show by himself, and I kind so of... the real victim. The real the victim kidney stone was me. <laughs> That's true, and I and I really wanted it to be a train wreck to kind of prove. Uh, how I was, you know, 74 to 75 to 76 percent of the show's success thus far. But honestly, I think he did a really good job. And so I'm not going to well, rip on him too much. I, I don't want to take all the credit. I owe a lot to Fred Durst and his <laughs> lyrical abilities. Without that, I wouldn't have been able to do what I did. But, you know, we, we, we struggled on and we made it through. I, I do seriously, though, want to talk a little bit about the website and give my thanks to uh, to Jed Dawson. In addition to all this mm -hmm. uh, kidney stone business, I'm also in the process of job hunting, which has completely taken over my life when I get home from work. It's basically, uh, you know, nonstop searching through jobs, applying and writing and writing letters instead of uh, interesting or attempts to be interesting Star Wars uh, articles about comic books. And Jed has done a great job of keeping the website on life support and so i want to publicly thank him yeah and uh unfortunately with this kidney stone business it's going to get worse before it gets better i hope uh, i won't miss any more episodes news hey the internet went crazy when tops card company released a set of cards for the upcoming solo movie one of the characters names is therm scissor punch <laughs> No way. <laughs> yeah, this is serious. Scissors punch? Yeah. Wow. Scissor punch. Uh, Twitter responded with crazed eyes and foaming mouth, as it does, and it is called the worst name for a character ever. Luke, what do you think about... This is obviously your first time hearing about it. What do you think about the name? I would, Scissor punch. I would pick him in Street Fighter 2, and we would beat the shit out of Dalism. What's he look like? <laughs> well, I actually... It's a card they have a picture yeah, of Yeah, I, right? brought, I brought you a different picture. This isn't the card picture. So um, this is what... Okay, so he looks like... Does he have arms? Yeah, these are his arms. He's he's got like, oh, so he's got he's got like pinchers yeah. and he's a squid man. Yeah, he's a squid man. What do you think of the name Therm Scissor Punch Man? I just, his name Scissor Punch. I'm I'm fine with that. Okay, so it's not the worst name. I just I figure with like a a, a property where your heroes are named Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and chew some tobacco that. This is not like who is chew gift. some tobacco. Yeah, well, it's that's you know. Wow. Yeah. No. I. It, yeah. It's dumb, but who cares? It's a Han Solo movie. None of us give a shit about this movie. We all want it to be terrible. So let's have dumb me? names and you know, see Daenerys do whatever she does. You know, and let Donald Glover save it. Well, I don't even know if I should bother asking the second question now because we're gonna get to the Solo movie and Ron Howard is saying um, on Twitter that he is putting the finishing touches on Solo. And I wanted to gauge your excitement level now, but it seems like you've already made up your mind. I, I'm i not against this movie, but I'm it not. It seems like you are! I'm not anticipating said, it. I mean, it'll come out and I'll watch it and I'm sure it'll be somewhere in the middle. I don't, I, I'm, 
I don't know. I just I don't you see are Killjoy, and you are. Are you excited for this? Yes, I am. Are you? I really? am. Yeah. I I don't know. I I'm sure it'll be fine, but I I just I don't see anything to. I mean, especially when it's coming out what two weeks before Infinity War. I'd much <coughs> much after. after Infinity War. I'd much rather see Infinity War than see this. So it's just something that's kind of happening, and I'm anticipating it to be the worst Star Wars movie made, minus Caravan of Courage. And you know we'll go on. Well, it'll be better than Phantom Menace. I'll give it that. But it's 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 gonna be a throwaway. So you know when you go into this like worst Star Wars movie ever made and just completely pass over the prequels like they're good movies, you have like a very um, I don't know like an Ann Coulter feel about you where you're just like not you know like like thinking about facts. You're just coming with like this air of arrogance. And I just want want you to like talk a little bit about y- your defense of the prequels and how this is just which ones? Movies. Which you you pick since you love um, them so much. I don't. I'm sure, you kind of like. So them all. the the Phantom Menace is by far the worst Star That's Wars not movie true. ever it's made. Attack of the Clones. Terrible, but terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, other than the Darth Maul stuff, which is very good. Um, Attack of the Clones is is not good. I will definitely give it that. But the, the things that are good I like about it, like, I I enjoy Obi-Wan, I enjoy him going to Kamino, I enjoy <coughs> everything he does, basically, in that movie. I mean, the Padme Anakin stuff is the worst thing in Star Wars, by far. It's better than Jake Lloyd, or it's worse than Jake Lloyd. Yeah, That's how is. bad it is. Like it that, is. Yeah, that, that dialogue and all that is horrific. But in honesty, it's only, you know, to use a, a, a defensive... Uh, Age of Ultron. It's only a few minutes of other stuff. It's the second act. <laughs> it's yeah. It's the second act of the movie. So, just... so, no, I, but but I love the Yoda fight. I don't care what anyone I says. Like everyone Yoda else fight. loved yeah. the Yoda fight when it happened. It's only in hindsight that everyone decided they didn't like it. I liked. You have to remember that was the first time we saw more than one lightsaber in a fight. So I still find it awesome when you have all those oh, was Jedi. Phantom Menace was. More than three. Oh, um, okay. So now so we're just changing the fact. We are changing Ann it. Ann Coulter. What did I say? Yeah, exactly. No, but, I, you know, it was the first time you saw a masked Jedi do something. And basically close to the only time you see masked Jedi do something in a movie. So I still really enjoy the battle on Kamino. Uh, you know, b- the Jango Fett getting his head chopped off is fun for me. I think there's things to like about that movie. Am I going to say that's a good movie? No. But there's things I really like about it. Revenge of the Sith? I enjoy it. I like it better than Force Awakens. It tried to do something different. It fails in a lot of its aspects, but the Padme Anakin part is really tiny in this movie. Yeah, it is true. It is tiny in this General movie. Grievous is great. The you, talk, you talk about moments of the movie. You, you you wash over the second act of Attack of the Clones and call it like a moment, and then Grievous is there for what, 30 seconds? And he's no, he's, he's there for more than that. Um, but I enjoy him a lot. I enjoy that opening space battle. I think is really that fun. Space battle's great. Um, the end lightsaber battle is probably the third best lightsaber battle we have in Star Wars after uh, Ray and uh, Kylo Ren battling the Praetorian Guard and Obi Wan Anakin. Or uh, I'm sorry, not uh, Obi Wan and. Liam Neeson, Qui Gon fighting Darth Maul. You're not giving respect to the Force Awakens again, but I would, I would. Do you think that's a good lightsaber battle? I do because of the emotion behind it and the attention. I I absolutely do. I I actually think that that is one of the worst white lightsaber. Everything in the Force Awakens. No, no, no. It's 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 above Alec Guinness, David Prowse in A New Hope. It's better than that one, but it's it's not a very long or exciting lightsaber battle. Um. I don't think it's very... I, you know, I think that's one of my big criticisms when I really thought about it with The Force Awakens. And this is going to be a tangent episode because we watched the fire game and they actually won and I've been drinking for a while. But The Force Awakens, other than the the sequence on uh, Mass Kanata's planet with the, ti- uh, with the uh, X-Wings, it has bad battles. There aren't memorable battles in The Force Awakens for me. Like, the end... Space battle is just a, a boring, you know, New Hope trench run ripoff. That lightsaber battle is bad. The Wrath Tars are bad. Um, there aren't a lot of good battles in that movie, which is disappointing to me. Not memorable battles, which is part of the reason it gets it gets ranked lower for me. But to go go back to Revenge of the Sith, uh, they, they tried to do something different, and I appreciate that. And I think a lot of it worked. A lot of it didn't. But I appreciate the try. And I also have to say, 
And I think that Ian McDermott's take on Darth Sidious and his kind of... You, you get the understanding that he realized the bullshit he's saying is dumb as hell. And he's just going to have as much fun as he possibly can in this role of Emperor Palpatine, Darth Sidious, is really great. I think it's it's one of the best things to come out of Star Wars. It's definitely the best thing to come out of the prequels. And I think that's fun. And I, and I like them. I Well, I like, I like one and a half of them. How about that? Uh, here's what I'll say about that. Um, I've learned in my life when somebody's acting belligerently without evidence, you just ignore them. So I'm going to focus on solo Star Wars story and say oh, this. Oh, that's right. We were talking if, about uh, that. If Ron Howard is able to pull this off, it's going to be amazing because of the, the, the difficulties in production. What he's been asked to do is a huge undertaking um, just from a from a purely schematic standpoint that, that there was no delay in this film is also amazing. And if it is good, it will be legendary. And I'm choosing to put my faith behind this movie. And yes, I'm excited for it. I loved Han Solo growing up. So the, the chance to get to see it, I'm, I'm behind it now. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. So, so you're expecting a good movie to come out of this. I'm like expecting it... a solid movie. I'm hoping for a good movie. Okay. I think there are pieces of this that I think could be great. I, I honestly find this movie a little bit freeing as far as Star Wars fandom from the fact that I have no expectations. So if it turns out to be disappointing, I'm not that upset. If it turns out to be good, awesome. Like, then that's more than I was hoping for and it, it'll be good. I, I kind of find that a tad bit liberating to not have to have giant weight on it that a lot of these Star Wars movies seem to take on. I think for these new movies, I've really, really loved two out of the three. And one was a disappointment to me, even though I think in ways that it was a solid film, in ways that I have huge issues with how it was made. And so if this is a good movie, that gives it sort of rejuvenates my own personal opinion about the franchise. Whereas if it's bad, then I'm kind of like, well, 50-50... I don't really know, and so I'm really... I, I'm, a lot is riding on this movie for me. This is something that I think we can both agree on, which doesn't happen a ton. Right. But we're going to look at the previous example of of what Han Solo is trying to be, what it is, what it's going through, and that is Rogue One, which had tons of turmoil behind the scenes, and everyone thought it was going to be terrible, blah, blah, blah. We both love this movie. Oh, yeah. Like, love, love this movie. Yeah, it's my second favorite. And there are days when I think it might be my first because I love Jyn Erso so much and I love Cassian so much. And and not to go too tangent over even though this is going to be the tangent episode, one of my criticisms of modern movies in this day and age is almost every modern movie that is long, that is popcorny, that is comic booky, has a horrific final act that you just want to be done. And this is a movie that is the best final act you'll ever see in a movie. So I, I love Rogue One to death, but my my long-winded point about this is everyone thought Rogue One was going to suck and was going to be terrible. We both loved it. Maybe Solo will be that, and hopefully it is. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping for too. Uh, let's get to news item number three. A couple weeks ago you asked me, you challenged me to look into the last Jedi novelization, and um, I did. Uh, you talked about how it made you like Force Awakens a little bit more, and I found it totally underwhelming. I don't know if I read an article that wasn't as forthcoming as the one that you did, um, but I want to have that conversation now. I, I read about Luke and Kami and his his you know like oh. daydreams beforehand, and I read a little bit extra about Snoke, but I felt like we already kind of knew that. If you what read... about Ray? What about I? I so... In the article, you, you got to tell me now. Spoilers. Okay. So, Obviously. this is the main point I was talking about in the novelization, is one of the things they talk about is that uh, Snoke connected Rey with Kylo Ren earlier than we thought, like before Last Jedi time. So she was able, subconsciously, to pull over a lot of his knowledge of how to use the Force, which explains why she is able to do so much in The Force Awakens with no training and no experience. Oh, that makes and I thought that was a very cool explanation of why she is so adept at doing Jedi mind tricks, which she does to Daniel Craig, and able to just you know wield a lightsaber right away when her character in The Force Awakens isn't really built with that skill set. Uh, in the when you watch the Force Awakens initially, she, it's it's like all of a sudden she's just a master Jedi, and you kind of don't know why. And the novelization's explanation of her being Force connected to Kylo Ren and absorbing some of his knowledge of how to do all these things, even though she doesn't realize it, makes a lot of sense. Makes her a stronger character for me. 
Uh, I thought it was a great way to kind of transition her from the character she is in Force Awakens to the character she is in Last Jedi. And I, I thought that was a really smart thing to do, and I kind of wish they would have mentioned that in the movies. Yeah, and there's a chance they might mention it in the third movie, you know what I mean? When it yeah. of gets un- un- uh, unveiled and that sort of thing. Um, no, I like that a lot. Were there other things that came out in the article that you read? I mean, I, I, th- I guess... W- the research that I put into it was not very good because I only got those two things. Uh, that was the main thing. I also like they, they went into Snoke's backstory a little bit more, which I know a lot of people were disappointed with, even though in The Last Jedi, I don't think that's important because he's a, to me, he's a mechanism that turns Kylo Ren into the ultimate badass that he becomes at the end of Last Jedi. But I like the fact that they mentioned that the Emperor was aware of who he was was a little worried about what he was doing, and that also there was a contingency plan for the emperor or for the empire, if the emperor was to die, and that Snoke took advantage of that contingency plan and created the First Order out of that. So when the empire falls apart, all the ships kind of go back, and all the generals and all the leaders and you know the grand admirals that are out there, they fall back into this back this back plan that the Emperor had installed and Snoke is able to rise into the leadership of that. And that explains why you have a super powerful first order, Mm -hmm. which I think needed more in uh, the force Force awakens. Awakens. Cause I I would agree there. Yeah. They, they shifted things a little too back to a new hope a little too quickly without, and I get that they were worried that people were turned off with the politics of the prequels. But I think the the Force Awakens needed more world building. Mm-hmm. They didn't do a good job of that. They threw us right back into A New Hope because they wanted to recreate what everyone loved, which I understand why they did that. But I personally wanted more world building, and they really did that it's, through the novelization. It's easy to do that in A New Hope when it's like all of this is new and you buy so much because it's the first time you've ever seen a Star Wars movie. And... But now you have to look at it in the context of that we've seen six movies by the time Force Awakens comes out, and we have an understanding of those politics, even if we didn't really like it, and we have an understanding of the politics of of the original trilogy too, and so we want to know how we get from Return of the Jedi to um, to the Force Awakens. Would have liked more information in the Last Jedi. Don't think we're going to even bother getting it in Episode Nine now because now it's kind of too late. But yeah, I don't. Those think are so those are interesting things and. And yeah. they make sense. So, my recommendation to everyone is to get the novelization, because I think if you like those type of details, you're going to get a lot of that in the Last Jedi novelization, and it it sounds like it's worked out to a certain extent. Yeah, I, uh, I was was going to do that. We talked the last time when we had this conversation that I was considering buying the novelization, but I have recently rewatched the the Last Jedi and really did not enjoy it, and I actually enjoyed it less than I did um, the times that I saw it in the theater, so I'm not going to buy the novelization because I don't want to. I don't want to spend the time trying to get through all that stuff just for the tidbits yeah. that I can well, steal if you from don't, the internet. If you don't like it, you don't like it. So why right. linger on it? Right. So speaking of lingering, let's talk about our kids seriously serious questions. I got some bad news. Oh no! Screed Junkies has a segment called Serious Questions. Oh and, God! And at first, I was extremely pissed off because. I couldn't fathom how some corporate bigwigs like those guys would pick on us, the little guy, and steal our ideas and just take. And then I realized that they were doing it a month before we even named the show. So oh, it has nothing to do yes, uh, with Yeah, but them. were they in lacrosse in the 90s saying, kid, seriously, kid? I, I understand, and I, and I feel like this is a huge bummer, but we need a new name for this segment. Do you have any ideas? Nope. Well, that's helpful. Not a one. That's helpful. Uh, Pat and KC writes, I like the trailer shows. That Cobra Kai trailer was fresh. What wow. is your guys' favorite movie, not just Star Wars? So favorite movie, not best movie. So that's that... different. Right. That is different. So for, for me, my favorite movie is Night of the Living Dead by George Romero from the 60s. It is a movie that I started watching as a little kid. My mom, who is very much into cinema... Gave that to us as a sleepover as little kids, probably, I don't know, second or third grade. And my brother and I fell in love with it. Watched it every weekend, basically. And it's a movie that has grown and evolved with me as I've grown and evolved. You know, as a little kid, you don't get all the social commentary that George Romero is throwing out there. Um, You just get the, the fun and the horror and all those things that I love anyway. And then as I got older, I started to realize 
you know, what he was trying to accomplish with his commentary of the civil rights movement, of what happens to Ben at the end of that movie, which is horrific as an adult, which I never picked up on as a kid. But that is the movie I have seen more than any other movie by probably a thousand times. Uh, and, you know, no matter what comes out, you know, between now and hopefully the next, I don't know, 40 years before, 40 or 50 years before I die, I think that's always going to be my favorite movie. Not the best movie, because that's Metropolis, but my favorite movie uh, that I will watch endlessly. Pat, first of all, I want to say thank you for uh, for chiming in, as you always do. For me, comic book movies are always going to rank very highly because I just have loved the comic book genre so much and spent so much time in it. Uh, my two favorite movies, um, number one two. is probably Black Panther, uh, but very close is Captain America Winter Soldier. And I mention those two because I'm real fresh off of Black Panther right now and want to make sure after a couple of viewings when it comes out on video, that it is, in fact, the favorite. But I, I think at this point, it surpa surpassed Captain America, who's my favorite comic book hero. In non-nerd movies, I really enjoy Office Space. That's a movie I could watch back-to-back -back, uh, over and over again. So, but How many times have you seen Black Panther? Just once. Okay. We all got sick so many times this winter that well, we haven't gone in. I, I don't fault anyone for seeing a movie in the theater once. Yeah. Um, Pat and Casey also writes, What? Luke knows Taylor Swift? So I, was, I told him, I wrote back and said, I'll, I'll allow Luke to tell the story. So I don't, I don't know Taylor Swift. Like, we're not friends. She would have no idea who I was if you ran into her. But well, I don't know. You're a memorable dude. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure she has no clue who I am. Uh, when I was young, I worked out of college at a country music radio station. And we had a new artist showcase, I believe we called it, where we had about six artists that we brought in that had maybe one song on the radio at a small club. And we were going to uh, have this concert where they could all show off their music or whatever. And Taylor Swift was one of them. And she had one song on the radio called uh, Tim McGraw, which did okay, but it didn't do as well as everything else on that album was about to do maybe a month or two later. But we brought her in, and she was, I don't know, 15 or 16. And uh, at one point, she was there with her mom. And at one point, her mom had to go do something. I don't remember what it was. And my boss said, can you hang out with her and just make sure she's good and, and all this stuff. So her and I sat in a uh, the upstairs of a club in Minneapolis, and we hung out together. And I got her a couple bottles of water, and we talked for a while, and she was 100% pleasant. I have nothing negative to say about her. Uh, she was a 15 or 16-year-old kid that was so enthusiastic that anyone wanted to hear her sing or talk or do anything. She couldn't believe she was there. She was 100% nice. I have no clue if she's like that now or what, but uh, yeah. So she, she doesn't know me. We're not friends. Uh, I didn't babysit her as a little kid. I hung out with her for like an hour or two while her mom went and ran errands. But uh, she was she was very nice. That story makes Boom really happy, by the way. That's like Does her it? favorite story about everything. To it, find out that Taylor Swift is nice. And that's what I told her. because that's She, she said, was. Um, that like filled her heart with so much immense joy. So I just got a quick yeah. side question. Uh, can you uh, hook... Pat and KC up with her digits, man. With her digits. Yeah. No, no, she, I cannot. And I mean, he hooks you up by no. listening to your show. Can you... Uh... I, I cannot. Again, oh. she does not know who I am. You know, it's funny because whenever I have to go to uh, work conferences or these deals where you have a group of people and they always say, oh, tell us something about yourself that people wouldn't know, that's the story I use that I had to babysit Taylor Swift when she was 15 or 16 for a few hours. And the first question I get, no matter what no matter where I am, is, did she write one of her songs about you? And my immediate response is, no, because that would make me a child molester. Because I was 25, and she was 15 or 16, and that's disgusting. Uh, but, so no. I don't know any of that stuff about her, but I have nothing but positive what about things her mom? Do you know, to do you, say. Do you get some of my mom? Uh, I'll leave that to myself, because, you know, that might have worked or not worked. We'll leave it go. Hey, uh, Joy writes, this is not fair because you guys don't have Judd here. But you just posted your five favorite Spielberg Spielberg movies. While there are some similarities, there are some big differences. 
Uh, could you talk about those? And for reference, the people who didn't see the article, Neitzel's list was one, was Schindler's list, two, Jaws, three, Jurassic Park, four, Saving Private Ryan, and five, The Last Crusade, while Maya Madrid's, that's me, it was number one, Raiders of the Lost Ark, two, Schindler's list, three, Munich, four, Last Crusade, and five, Catch Me If You Can. So the major ones it looks like we need to talk about are Jaws, Jurassic Park, Saving Private Ryan, and the one that you really want to talk about, Munich. Yeah, so... Munich's the argument for me because that's the only one you put on your list that I do not like. And I do not like that for a couple of reasons. First, it's surprisingly bad lead performances from Eric Bana and Daniel Craig. Not because I think particularly high of Eric Bana or Daniel Craig, but, but you generally get better performances in Spielberg movies from the lead actors. But Eric Bana and Daniel Craig are not enough to carry a movie especially a movie that's trying to hold a lot of weight my other problem with this movie is i don't know entirely what it's trying to say other than this is complicated it doesn't take an opinion either way it doesn't go harshly at anything it it just kind of kind of meanders in the middle which i think is a really weak position to take on something that is a really hard issue to tackle, which is Israel in the the post-Nazi Germany world. Is what they do ethical? Is what they do, you know, for the best of the people? He had a chance to make a statement either way, and he didn't make a statement regardless. And outside of that, I think that the culmination of that movie in a lot of ways is one of the worst tonal shifts or tonal misfires in movie history which is eric banna having sex with his wife while envisioning the munich athletes being killed i don't know what he was going for in that sequence but whatever it is it failed for me on every single level it possibly could there are elements of this movie i really really like the tension in the scene with the phone bomb if you're familiar where they, they placed a, a bomb in the phone of a, a, a Palestinian, I believe, that they want to blow up, but he has a wife and a family, and they don't want to kill his wife and his daughter. And the daughter sinks in. The tension of those things are built by an expert filmmaker that Spielberg is. It's fantastic. There are things like that that I really praise about this movie, but as a whole... I think it's a mess without a lot to say, and that's a real disappointment from someone who I generally think, even if when he's kind of uninteresting, is really tight with what he's doing, and that just didn't happen for me here in this movie. For the most part, I don't really like Steven Spielberg, um, but the things that I like, I, I like a lot. And my list comes from the reaction that I had when I watched the movie. I've seen Munich one time, and what I took away with it is I really thought it was ten tense in a lot of great places and i felt on the edge of my seat the second thing about the the point of it basically saying that this is complicated in a world where everybody takes a very specific stance either pro-jewish or pro-palestinian i think the answer is a very complicated one and i think that's what i enjoyed out of the movie the other stuff i can't really argue with you there i don't even really remember it that well all i remember is that i saw it it was super late at night and i extremely <laughs> enjoyed it um, the Catch Me If You Can was another one. That's another movie that I really, really enjoyed. But I can't speak to Jaws because I've never seen it. And Jurassic Park, I don't really like dinosaurs. Well, and, and Catch Me If You Can, I, this is probably not what Joey was going for, is not as interesting. I, Catch Me If You Can is enjoyable. He's just made better movies for me than that. Yeah. I don't. I don't think it's a terrible movie. I don't fault someone for liking that movie. Well, I thought you. I, I thought you I, really didn't it's, like it. No, no. I. I think it's fine. I think it's. Uh, it's. It's overly long, but you get really good performances from the lead, the 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 two lead actors. I. I think it's enjoyable, but I think if you look at his whole filmography. I think there's more to look for. Like there's other movies that I had to leave off that pain me. Like on my list, I left off. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Which... Yeah, that that's one that I, I was shocked that you didn't have. And why, And I want to talk a little bit about that in a sec, about why you like Last Crusade, but more than Raiders. Part, part of it is I didn't want to put two Indiana Jones movies on my list. Um, and I, I just like Last Crusade better. And then the other one is I really enjoy Minority Report. Yeah. But I, I, I just I couldn't find it. a spot in the five spot. 
for it, even though, you know, like, like Saving Private Ryan is one, I have a lot of issues with the final third of that movie, like a lot I hate of issues. That movie. I hate that movie. So, but that completely changed the way we film, look, express war movies. It did. It I did. The, it. the first, the first two thirds of that movie, I think, are as good as anything Spielberg's ever done. On par with Schindler's List, as far as redefining war movies, emotionality, all that. And they threw it away in the final third, and that disappointed me. But I think it still needs recognition for what it it did for war movies. Because we film war movies in a completely different way. Pre, uh, a post-Saving Private Ryan versus pre-Saving Private Ryan. You see the line of what a war movie could be based on when that movie came out. And... It needs its due based on that, even though I have my issues with the end of it. I hate it. I hate that movie. The final third makes me want to punch myself in the face. So let, let's do this Indiana Jones thing. Yeah. So. so do you want to hear why I like Raiders better? Go ahead. Um, like I wrote in the article, and again, I've been going. I've had kind of a hard week, guys. Um, but I just wrote a bunch of one-liners, and what I said about Raiders is it's or Last Crusade is it's Raiders in my mind it's just everything is less so raiders i think has a better story the female um love interest in in indy's life is unbelievable like i think that's might be my favorite character in any of the indiana jones movies uh marion ravenwood and um it the story is tight the acting performances are good i i think it was just everything was was a cut above the last crusade which i also really enjoyed i rank it what do i rank it fourth um but i just last crusade is i I just watched it recently and introduced boom to it and it's good it's just there there are some points that are just it's just not as good for me as raiders of the lost ark it's it's a little slow it's a little jumbled um the performances break down in some areas um the the ending is phenomenal don't get me wrong um but but i just don't think it's as good Part of it for me is nostalgia. I saw The Last Crusade in theaters. I believe it was the first one of his I saw. So I loved it from the get-go. Side note, story, tangent story, tangent episode. Tangent episode. We had, I saw this in, I believe I was in third grade, and we had a project then in third grade where they would cut a hole in a piece of paper, and you were supposed to draw pictures around the piece of paper to incorporate the hole. And the example they gave was the eye patch of a pirate. So I saw it as an eye, and I, having just loved The Last Crusade, drew a series of Nazis. Oh my gosh. <laughs> which got a letter sent home to my parents, and then I had to have a talk with everyone about why I was drawing Nazis at school. I'm sure that was awkward for my mom and dad. But I, I love this movie based on that, but I also think that the chemistry between Sean Connery and Harrison Ford is, good. is unmatched in any other Harrison Ford movie. He is never connected with an actor like he did in, with Sean Connery in that movie. Their interplay is fantastic um, at the time, and now I still love the fact that Elsa's a bad guy and that it doesn't work out for them. I will 100% give you that Karen Allen in uh, Raiders is one of the best female characters ever put on film, and for the 1980s is uh, decades beyond her time because that is an independent woman for the most part can do everything on her own without the help of a man. And we need more of that shit in the eighties and we need that constantly now still as well. It's, it's just when I connect more. And, and the only reason Raiders didn't make my top five is because I didn't want to put two Indiana Jones on the same list. And you know, between, but between the two last crusades, just always going to be a step above. E.T. is not on it either. Either of our lists. I don't know if it made anybody's list. I don't know if it made... It made Jed's. Did it make Jed's? Okay, yeah. I was going to ask you about your thoughts on E.T. Oh, uh, so I've only seen it once when I was a little kid, and I hated it. And uh, so, you know, I mentioned earlier in the show that I watched Night of the Living Dead when I was in grade school, and I watched Terminator 2 in the theater when I was 8 or 9 or something like that, and I watched endless horror movies. I could watch monsters eating people's flesh with no problem at all the thing i could not watch is people being separated from their families my mom took me to go see an american tale oh god where fido gets separated (laughs) from his family and the biggest fear i had in my life was being separated from my my mom especially because i am the definition of a mama's boy and i spent that entire movie 
And the only reason we stayed is because I had a friend with me that my mom brought as well, crying under the seat of my chair because I cannot handle someone being separated from their family. So I saw E.T. as a little kid. I saw um, a guy who was separated from his family and the horror of him trying to get reconnected with that. And I could not handle that. And I have never revisited that movie and I will never revisit that movie. Luckily, my kids don't want to see it because... That shit affects me more than anything else in the world. So I I can appreciate that he probably accomplished a lot of things with that movie, but it's a subject matter that I struggle with more than any other. I had never seen it, watched it with my daughter because she really wanted to see it. She loved it. I was kind of like, I didn't understand the big deal. You know, people had talked about how great this movie was. So uh, that's the end of our Kids Seriously Serious uh, segments. We're going to come back next week with a new name. Uh, probably the exact same format, though. But be sure to email us at kidsseriouslyradio. Or excuse me, kidsseriouslyradio at gmail dot com and send your questions into the show. You will get on air, we promise. And while you're at it, if you could smash that subscribe button and help us get one closer to our goal of eleven, that would help <laughs> us immensely. Let's move on to the Clone Wars, season one, episode ten, Lair of Grievous. Most powerful. Is he who controls his own power. <laughs> Directed by Atsushi Takechi and written by Henry Gilroy, Lair of Grievous asks the question. What do war criminals do in their off time? As Jedi's Kit Fisto and Nadar Veb infiltrate the home of General Grievous and attempt to rid the galaxy of the lightsaber spinning villain for good, Luke Knights will take it away. So we open up on this one, and our guy from last episode, Viceroy Gunroy, has escaped from the, the Republic hands, and he is being whisked away to wherever they whisk away people. And, uh... Padme and whatever that shitty Jedi she was stuck with uh, send a quick video message over to our guy, Kit, saying... <laughs> Did you just call Ahsoka shitty? No, the other Jedi <laughs> she's with. that was, She was a shitty Jedi that Ahsoka <laughs> saved. But anyway, they send a message over saying that uh, they need to find Gunray and Kit Fisto has been tracking the signal and he thinks he has found the mysterious place where Gunray is. Hey, man, speaking of Kit Fisto... And Star Wars and the racism problem. He's not a negative stereotype per se, but he is very clearly a stereotype. He's got these long tails that are, that are you know, he's green, but he's basically like Jamaica Jedi. And I was wondering your thoughts. Like, he's not, he's not disrespected in the way that Gunray is. And is that different to you? Is it okay to have a guy that's a clear representation of, of a minority if it's done with respect versus Gunray, who is clearly, especially in Phantom Menace, done without respect. Yeah, I'm okay with that because I think we want to see minority voices. I don't want a white actor doing every single part. Um, and I don't think this was played to comedic effect. It wasn't overly played. It was just he had an accent that appeared to be Jamaican. And or it could be it could be African too, or Af yeah, say. West African, yeah. any of those things. But it wasn't it wasn't overly played. I didn't think it was just how he talked. I also found the depiction of Kit Fisto to be one of the most likable Jedi we have ever had that's, that's in this why series. I just wanted to ask the question because I really dig Kit Fisto exactly because Kit Fisto is not dogmatic. He is not overly tense and lecturing everything about everything. He is a guy who goes, this is a situation, we're going to deal with it, and this is how we do it. Um, so I really ended up buying into who he is and what he was trying to accomplish and how he went about it. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't critiques of this episode that we're going to get into, but I do not think this is a, a Watto, Newt Gunray, Jar Jar type issue where they have taken a certain ethnic type and made a joke of it. I think he was a, a serious portrayal of someone who just happened to have an accent you could associate with, uh, you know, the West Indies or West Africa. So anyway, Kit ends up uh, landing on this planet 
the the Vasic system where he's going to meet up with a former Padawan of his, which is Nadir, who is a Mon Calamari, which is what Admiral Akbar is. And they are going to try to find out if Newt Gunray is there. A and, newly Jedi Knight, Nadar. Yes, so it sounds like he has only been a Jedi Master for, a, and I did quote marks, you can't see, but he's only been one for... Um, you know, a few weeks or something like that. He's very new to it. It's the first time him and Kit have met since he has become a full one. Uh, he couldn't, <coughs> Kit couldn't be there for his trials because he was too busy fighting a war. And for those of you, Kit is also featured very heavily in um, Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. He has kind of, uh, he's, he's green. He has what could be called dreadlocks or long tendrils that come off of his hair. He is the Jedi in Attack of the Clones that force pulls off C-3PO's head from the droid body, the attack, the battle droid body he is attached to. So you've seen him before. He's also featured in the, um, Aronofsky, uh, not Aronofsky, uh, Tartakovsky Clone Wars. Uh, he had a whole episode dedicated to him fighting underwater. So he's someone we're familiar with. He is fan-fucking-tastic. Uh, but he, they show up, they use their force to pull the fog away, and they realize they are outside a giant castle or bunker, along with a couple clone troops. They are able to bust into there, and the deer does it with uh, a little bit of intensity, which Kid is not happy about, and which our, our moral may have alluded to, that maybe Nadir is a little too much into using his power and not thinking so much about what he's trying to accomplish. Which is one of the issues that I have, and I and I will let the cat out of the bat, I really enjoyed this episode, um, but one of the issues that I have is they treat him like a Padawan, so why make him a Jedi Knight? Is it just to, I don't want to get too far ahead of us, but is it just to put it into context what happens later? Because uh, he's basically acting like Ahsoka. I, I think so. I think this is uh, something they wanted to accomplish with Ahsoka as far as the messaging goes. But, you know, I mean, the show is a spoiler. Like, they're going to kill him at the end of the episode, and they can't kill Ahsoka. So this is a way to show an Ahsoka storyline where they are able to kill Ahsoka, which right. they can't do with actual Ahsoka. And he's he's also very young, but if you make him a Padawan, that tells kids. You know, like, the first Jedi you're going to kill in the show is going to be a kid. Yeah. That's gonna, might be kind of You know, I, I, I know. feel like I, I bought into it a little bit, though, because uh, if you've ever been at a position where you go from being intern to full-time or something of that nature, people, myself included, because I've been in this position, you tend to be overly aggressive to show that you're adult, you're mature, that you have really earned this level that you have been granted, and he overreaches that, which I think a lot of people do. So I'm not overly taken aback by how they handled that with him being a, a Jedi master. And it also, again, feeds into a reoccurring theme of the Jedi not being very good at what they're supposed to be doing, and that leads to their downfall. And I'll talk more about this later, but I have a real problem with how it all wraps up at the end uh, and how it deals with Nadar. Agreed with some of these. But anyways, they bust into this castle structure, not really knowing what it's going to be or, or, or what it's about. They end up looking around and they find some statues of an ancient warrior with him killing lots of people. And then they bust in and realize that this is actually Grievous's lair because they find a bunch of his robotic uh, replacement parts. His arms, his legs, his face plates, things like that he needs. And that is when we cut over to Grievous flying towards the planet and having a conference with Count Dooku who is very unhappy with all that Grievous has encountered, and we learn that this is going to be a test for Grievous. He's not going to let him know that the Jedi are there. Uh, he's not going to let him know that he has deactivated his guards who are there to protect him because he wants Grievous to prove that he is worthy of everything they have given him. So this is going to be a battle to the death between um, Grievous and these Jedi that they have unleashed, Dooku has unleashed on the scene to see if he is worthy of it. Which and makes you realize how screwed up the Separatists really are. You know what I mean? Like, if you want to fire a guy, oh. well, what happened to just, you know, using Twitter like like we do nowadays, you know? Uh, you don't have to send, like, <laughs> like, you could just fire him. You don't need to send all these people to flip and kill him or, you know, to have him prove well, his merit. And I think this is interesting because it's, it's something I'm hoping we get into more in the show because it never comes up in the movies. So Grievous and Dooku never share a scene in the movies. And the only line that they really share in common is that after Dooku is killed in Revenge of the Sith, Grievous asks uh, Darth Sidious how they will move on with the loss of Dooku. But you never get a sense of what their relationship was, how they related to each other, all that. 
And what we find out here in these episodes is they fucking hate each other. And mm. they're basically working on removing each other from power. Right, because this is a dick move by Dooku. Like, this is going to hurt the Separatists. He's, he's trying to undermine Grievous to get him tossed out. Um, and Grievous even bitches about the fact that, you know, they want him to kill all these Jedi, but all they give him are these shitty droids that can't do anything. And the droids themselves even talk about how they can't ever kill a Jedi. Um, so Grievous kind of knows he's been given, like, the, the low cards in this hand versus Dooku. So it's interesting to see that dynamic explored, and I did enjoy that for them. As we move through the episode, the Jedi obviously encounter Dooku right away, which leads into a pretty good fight, I would say, between yeah. them. One of the things I liked about this is it's the first time we see Dooku use all four arms, which we've only ever seen in Revenge of you the mean Sith. Grievous. Or Grievous, excuse me. Use all four of his robot arms. He whips them out to fight the Jedi. They have a pretty good fight, and they are able to, especially Kit Fisto, are able to hold their own. They actually chop his legs off, yeah. which is pretty cool. Um, and he it does also, the. It also shows how extremely hard it is to kill him. Because yes. they chop off his legs. They've got all these clone, clone troopers shooting like suction cups to try to keep him down. And he's yeah. like maneuvering around. He like falls down, skitters away. Like he's like impossible to kill, which makes the Revenge of the Sith death much more satisfying. Exactly. And he does something that he does in Revenge of the Sith that I also really enjoy, whereas he basically is able to rotate his wrists. 360 degrees and make his lightsaber spin all the way around is kind of this impenetrable field he does that multiple times to fight the jedi which i think is something that's really fun to watch and i i really enjoyed he ends up escaping from those guys and goes to his doctor droid who is a smart ass droid that's what i was gonna say that droid would not live under grievous grievous would kill that droid. no but i enjoyed him oh yeah i love him we... but i'm kind of like dude you need to chill because grievous is but I thought he was a good contrast because we've seen the uh, regular battle droids try to be smart ass and they're annoying as fuck. Right. And this guy was a smart ass who was interesting and fun and made sense in the context of what he was doing. And he helps fix Grievous, gives him a new mask. They actually pull his face off at one point, which I thought was fun. And it looked, and it looked like, you know, like when you get like a scab or, or something and it's like coming up and like that feeling of a, of skin being pulled away and you have Grievous like screaming. It's a great moment. And, and, I also thought they added some backstory to Grievous there as well because they they talk about why they don't understand why he would want these cybernetics connected to him because he was such a great warrior and he refuses to call them, you know, you changes. Know, the, changes. The He's updates, like, they're improvements, they're upgrades that are going to use to make me even a better warrior. So you understand why he is kind of cybernetic, kind of human and, and what he does and it's great. And then in the meanwhile, the Jedi are trying to make their way through there and Obviously, Nadir is trying to push things because we already Could know where his plot's cuter, going. Though? He, he is really he's cute. adorable. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would snuggle he's the shit out of he him. He tries so hard. He does. He he really wants to kill Grievous. He keeps trying to fight Grievous on his own, which is kind of laughable because any other encounter we've seen with Grievous, he manages to kill multiple Jedi very, very easily. And then they uh, they they decide that they're gonna they're gonna try to confront him, even though kind of Kit Fisto wants to just escape. Um, Grievous is able to kill all their support ships other than uh, Kit Fisto's spaceship and droid, which managed to fly off and go hide. And then Grievous is able to pull a truck on them as they, they go ahead. He's able to separate Nadir and Kit Fisto. So he is alone with Kit Fisto. Or uh, alone with Nadir, excuse me. Kit Fisto ends up going into his control room, which I didn't entirely get because if he's in the control room, he could just open the doors and go fight with Nadir. But instead, he just watches Nadir. I think he realizes it late because when he's when he's walking up to the control panel, it's got somebody's in there, and it's got you know for the second time in the episode, it's, you're coming up on the back of a um, the back of a chair, and so I don't think he realizes that Nadar's in trouble until late. Yeah, I'm not buying that. I think he could have he could have gotten there in time. Instead, he decided to watch. In my opinion, but either way, a fight breaks out between Nadir and Grievous. Grievous does a pretty sweet move, in my opinion. He uses his two main arms to block Nadir's uh, lightsaber and then just kills him with the other arms uh, and, and dies. And Kit Fisto has to watch it all through the screen, which is uh, uh, pretty funny. And then, and well, and I suppose dramatic if you're into that. But then uh, Kit Fisto and him, Kit Fisto decides he's just going to escape. He wants yeah. no part of any of this. He wants to get the fuck off that planet as soon as possible. He ends up... Uh, you know, trying to escape, but then Grievous encounters him. They fight for a little bit. Fisto is able to overpower him. He's the only Jedi we've really able 
to even go toe to toe with Grievous, let alone kind of overpower him. But then he just uses that to escape on his battle right. cruiser or his his spaceship with his droid, and then flies off. One thing I want to say, I, I think with Nadar and in the last episode, Argaius, is that these characters that they have created really have solved a stakes problem that the show has. If you introduce new characters, it means there's a risk that they won't make it out. And one of the characters is a bad character, and this new character on the good side. Um, I don't want it to be a formula where like new characters always die. But having these two characters, they were interesting. It shows that the that the show is, has, has a willingness to to raise the stakes and make these battles feel important. I agree, but it is a tightrope, because we can't have every new character just get killed like right. Argyus and, and Nadir here. Right. Um, so hopefully they, they give us a little bit of tension of who will live and who won't live. Like, we knew Kit Fisto was going to live, because he's in right. Revenge of the Sith. Um, and Nadir, from the minute you met him, you knew, from, well, from the opening scroll... About morals, you knew Nadir was going to die. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something they have to avoid because a lot of that stuff has been telegraphed lately. Like, you knew Argaius was going to be killed right. in the last episode, even though you knew he was going to betray him and you knew he was going to be killed. And we need to kind of avoid those obvious traps. So I hope they, they work on that. But I do think it added a lot to the story. So he escapes, Grievous escapes. Dooku is happy with what he did, but he's not 100% sure about him because Kit Fisto escaped, so Grievous' status is still up in the air. And then Yoda, at the end, we see him talking to Kit Fisto, kind of talking about the, the morals of the Jedi and how they can't compromise, like Nadir did, who they are to take a more aggressive, violent tone. And wow, did that they fucking totally, message miss the oh mark. Oh my gosh. They totally, there's a new... A new Jedi Knight that they allowed to pass the trials, that they told was a Jedi Knight, to put him in this situation and he dies and they shit all over him. Well, and I think the, the morality of the Jedi has always been something that I've hoped has been intentional bullshit by Lucas, but these type of things make me worry about their intentional bullshit. You look at the Phantom Menace, right? And they talk about there's there's certain things where the Jedi can and can't do things that is really convenient to the plot, right? Like, they can't interfere with the pod race. They don't say why. They just say they can't interfere with it. We have to let them do it. But they don't mind trying to trick Watto into taking worthless credits that just doesn't work because mind tricks don't work with them. They don't mind manipulating the chance dice to get what they want. There's a lot of gray area in what the Jedi do and don't allow, and it's kind of bullshit to uh, hold the deer to some standard that they don't seem to hold themselves to. So I found that to be a little. I wonder frustrating. if these are these are anywhere in the Journal of the Wills, and Luke Skywalker saw this and was like, "This is bullshit." You know, like when he's sitting there I, reading on his thing, drinking his cow I, milk. I would give some credit to that to to the thought that and and. Again, this is what I hope was intentional by Lucas, but I'm not entirely sure. It's definitely intentional by Johnson. Yeah, intentional by Johnson. And I hope it was intentional by Lucas to show that these Jedi who are controlling everything are just full of shit and bullshit and hypocrites. So many times with the droid and with, you know, like Anakin, you know, basically calling them out on it. And we've seen this over and over and over again. Yeah. So and, I, and then actually Palpatine calling them out on it too. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're full of shit. They deserve to fall. I mean, that's one of the things I've thought about them and that I'm definitely learning through Clone Wars. But I will say that this episode is interesting. It keeps your intention the whole time. Kit Fisto is the best Jedi we have ever seen as far as being interesting and engaging and wanting to stay with him, seeming like a real person who was making moral decisions based on what he believed, not just the bullshit that jedi tend to believe like we saw in the last episode my problems with this episode are still grievous they got to figure out what they want to do with him is he a badass force to be reckoned with like tartakovsky made him like revenge of the sith made him or he is he kind of a shit leader that dooku doesn't trust it, you got to pick one way and go with it. Like they either want to make him all powerful or they want to make him a whipping post. And I feel like they haven't picked one yet. And I hope we, we figure that out I, soon. I don't think you ever will. And I, and I think the reason why is because this is the fundamental problem with villains. The reason that we love Darth Vader is because when we saw a new hope, he was scary and terrifying. And the more that we got to know him, he becomes less scary and terrifying, but he becomes more of a well-rounded. Okay. Hold on. Because Rogue one, he was pretty scary and freaking terrifying, but, we learn but that's more Vader about, being Vader. right we learn more about him as as things went along and that's what grievous is going to happen what's going to happen with grievous 
when we saw Grievous first in the Clone Wars uh, animation and in Revenge of the Sith, like he was awesome. Mm-hmm. And and because he was awesome because of design, and he's awesome because just the presence. Now we're learning a little bit more of him, and that is the medicine that happens when you learn more about a villain. And I think, I would argue that you don't have to get one or the other. I think it's cool that him and Dooku don't get along. I think it's cool that maybe they're both trying to to, to vie for favor with Palpatine, with, with uh, Sidious. And, and I think that's just going to be the medicine that we have to take. So where do you put this episode? I have it too. Two. I loved this wow. episode. I thought Nadar was like super cute. I thought it raised the stakes because they killed a Jedi, which is something I didn't think that they were going to do. We haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen that yet. I thought the lightsaber battles were awesome. I, I disagree. I thought Grievous took a step up to me. Like, it doesn't matter that Dooku thinks he's a dick, I think, or thinks he's a douchebag. I think Grievous is talking about, look, you want me to do these things, but you give me this crap. Like, screw you guys. And then he takes on clone troopers and two jedi and defeats them really and um i I, he raised he was raised in my mind Uh, he's he's now my favorite character i want to like dooku the most my favorite character on that side of things is is grievous so uh a couple of i I put this about five okay for me uh there are there's a bulk of episodes i like a lot more so is this ambush for number one so no no rookies is number rookies number one Okay, um, my my problem with this is um, a, a couple things on that, and one is I need to get past this, is that even though they say Tartakovsky is canon, we have to throw this away as it's not canon. I haven't seen the whole... Tartakovsky. Okay, because in the Tartakovsky, they don't meet Grievous till right before the battle of um, Coruscant, mm-hmm. which obviously doesn't happen here. And in that battle, he battles, I believe, five Jedi and handle, man handles them. So if you're going to take that Grievous into account, you're not going to believe that Kiss, Kit Fisto can hold a candle to him mm. um, type thing. And I have to let that go. So that's on me a little bit. The other problem I had with this is that Ventress was so good in the last episode. She was so all-powerful and so dominating that it's hard for me to look at Grievous as a big threat when he's kind of wishy-washy on what he can accomplish and Ventress manhandled a Padawan and a Jedi Master with ease in the last episode. Um, so I was hoping we would go back to Ventress because she's the one they built up and made more powerful. And I'm a little disappointed that we get kind of a weaker Grievous as in comparison to Ventress because I'd like them to be equals or at least close to equals. And I don't think we got that. But there is so much to like about this episode. Like you mentioned, the lightsaber lightsaber battles are phenomenal. It moves along really briskly. The Jedi are super engaging in this episode, even if Yoda's moral is a little off base at the end. I thought the music was really good. Real music too, really the, good. The, the the tension with it—it it was just so simple. There were just drums in a lot of it, and it it was great. And and Grievous's palace kind of serves to be like a haunted house almost like there's traps and things and you kind of wonder if they can get through it type and they really ratchet the music up to fit the house as they move from section to section so that was actually something i had written down too is that this is for me the best musical Mm -hmm. episode that they've had as far as it so it's a good episode i recommend it to everyone it's not perfect for me but it's definitely one of the better ones. Yeah, I liked it. I have it right between Rookies and Ambush. So I, I'm I'm just going to say uh, three and a half pews from Marjorie. Out of five? Out of five. Okay. Very good. Well, uh, what do you got for other nerd news? I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. So I was on vacation last week. I went to Arizona with my family to go visit my moms down in Tucson And uh, one of the things that I find tricky with flying is I like to download movies on my iPad, but A, I knew I was going to be sitting next to my daughter, and then I had no idea who I was going to be sitting next to on the other end. So you have to find movies you can download that don't, are overly violent or have sex or nudity so that people around you don't think you're a fucking psychopath or that my daughter doesn't freak out about. So I ended up downloading off of Netflix, Kubo and the Two Strings. Nice. Have you seen that movie? I haven't seen it. So that is kind of a, in the Coraline stop animation style. Um, it is a Japanese fairy tale about a little boy on a quest. Uh, he has like a, a, a two-string, you know, guitarish instrument that he can use to control origami paper. He ends up befriending a, a monkey, uh, voiced by Charlize Theron, and um, a beetle by Matthew McConaughey. 
This is insanely entertaining. Absolutely blown away with it. I I expected to enjoy it. I didn't expect it to love it. Like one of the best animated movies I have ever seen. Awesome. I cannot recommend this movie enough. It was so much fun. It was so whimsical. Um, I'm a big fan of anime. Ninja Scroll is one of my favorite animes of all time. This is the rated G version of that. It has scary moments. It has great characters. It has a great message. It has fun action. This is uh, everything I personally, as an adult, would want to watch in a kid's movie with my kids. So go see Kubo and the Two Strings. It's free on Netflix uh, whenever you can. You've been a dad for a while. Watch a lot of these animated films. What is your favorite animated film of all time? My favorite anime film as a father. And a, and a, yeah, like a like kids movie sort of thing. Now that we're going through this. And... So the, the best balance of a movie that I can watch and that my kids will watch at the same time is Toy Story 2. It has a lot to say. It's fun. It's funny. The characters are engaging. My kids like it as well. There are other Pixar movies that I like better. Like, I think um, Inside Out is probably the best Pixar movie altogether as far as <laughs> Inside art. Out made my daughter think she's schizophrenic, okay? Oh, like, really? That's, that's I, been a huge problem. <laughs> I, I, I bawled through that whole movie while my two kids thought it was hilarious and funny. And I was like, oh, my God, everything I, I thought know. of as a parent, I need to change how I do things. Um, so I, I think that's a better movie, but the best balance of just fun for everyone is, is Toy Story 2. So I recommend that to, to everyone. I think that's, that's my favorite. Mine's Zootopia and maybe it's just because Boom is, is an only child and she's a girl, but the message of that movie hit me so completely hard because it's, it's hard when you're a dude and, and I was a, it was in a family where, where, you know, my mom was gone and then later my stepmom left and so i was in a very dude household so to have a little girl and uh you know it, it helped me understand what what she might be going through you know it, being a young lady uh, especially because because uh hops is exactly like boom if you think about it mm-hmm. um well you know i think it's it's an interesting contrast between the two of us because we both missed out on a parent yeah. to a certain extent but we missed out with the opposite gender of a parent so i think we see things through a different lens because of that right uh for me i have recently uh taken up Payne Lindsay and his podcast i watched up and vanished which was a podcast about a lady who disappeared um in the south she was a social studies teacher and was uh kidnapped and murdered and so kind of walked through that and i i emailed you about it and you'd said that you had liked it um, I actually liked Atlanta, or you had, you had some problems with it. I liked Atlanta Monster, the the newer one that he did even more. That's a podcast um, that's about a disappearance of 27 young, mostly black, mostly kids, mostly boys back in the 1970s. In Atlanta. In, in Atlanta. And um, I really enjoyed that one, but I would agree with you that he really does... I didn't think so in the in Up and Vanished, but in Atlanta Monster, he really puts himself into the story. Like, I could see what you were saying. Yeah, he, he does a good job of uh, creating a fascinating story, but my complaints were that he inserts himself into the story and likes to make himself more of a focal point than I prefer in a host. Um, I, I like to see documentaries where the host is an invisible force that moves things along. If you want a fantastic balance of a horse that is, or a host that is involved in the story, but doesn't make themselves the focal point of it. That is serial. Yes. But I want to ask you, do you know anything about season three? Uh, I need that. I Twitter that shit and Google that shit all the time and I can't find anything about it, but it's not fair to hold everyone to that standard right. of what they are able to accomplish. But that I is certainly the, hope you guys don't hold us to that standard. With, oh, God, no. But that is the perfect balance of we are involved in this, but we aren't going to make ourselves the focal point of it, even though you hear our voice strongly. And I think that Payne Lindsay in Atlanta Monster, in Up and Vanished, fails that test to a certain extent. It's still very much worthy of a listen, but I just wish he would have pulled back on himself a little. I agree. Hey, uh, this is a long episode. Yeah. We should start getting out of here. Luke, where can the people find you? I am available on Twitter at Luke underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L. For me, I'm at Maya Madrid. While you're sitting there, if you could smash that subscribe button and take us up to 11, that would be fantastic. But for now, we're going to get going. We're kids seriously, and we will see you later.
Bye. Thank you for listening to Kids Seriously. This episode was recorded and produced at Camro Studios. Visit our website at www.kidsseriously.wordpress.com or email us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Kids Seriously. Until next time. Thank <laughs> you.